All right, um, we're back uh, for just a couple of questions from our morning session. We have uh, a couple of our panelists here, Dr. Levitsky, Dr. Kalmet, uh, Dr. Franjfe, and then we will conclude uh, the second day of Mint 2021. Um, so a couple of questions that popped up for today. Um, there was a question that asked, if a patient responds to PPI therapy, has classic GERD symptoms, do you recommend attempting to wean off and then use PRN at that point? Or do you say, look, the medicine worked, you got to take this forever now? What do you guys think? Yeah, this is a classic case. Uh, we see this all the time. Uh, and I think the first thing I always try to do is to really heavily emphasize lifestyle and dietary modification, number one. Uh, and by adjusting the way, the style of eating, what timing of eating, even that those those factors alone sometimes can help me successfully wean a patient down and keep their symptoms at bay. I always like to stress the lowest amount of acid suppression needed while keeping life worth living and keeping a patient uh, with a high quality of life is my ultimate goal for them. So generally, I will try to wean them with these other measures on board as well. Yeah, I I, uh, I agree with with Ben. It, I think it's very individualized, and uh, it depends on how much uh, PPS they're on at the moment. If they're twice daily, daily, uh, if they're on a high dose, low dose. If they're on a low dose, sometimes I'll I'll switch them to the to a high dose H2 blocker, uh, such as pamotidine, forty twice daily, for example, and see how they do with that, and then see if I can further titrate down. And then uh, at the end of the day. Uh, figure out what's the threshold where they start having breakthrough symptoms. And, and sometimes I'll, I'll have patients where they'll do well with pamotidine uh, chronically. Uh, and, uh, and then if they have a flare up down the road, they can be uh, on PPIs for a period of time and then go back off of it. Some patients are just uh, a refractory to anything but PPIs. And, and in them, I, I, I try to keep the lowest dose possible and, and, Ultimately, let them know it's a. Uh, you have to balance the pros and cons. Uh, there are risks with PPIs, but uh, quality of life is also important. And and uh, mm -hmm. and and so it, it ends up being a very uh, uh, frank and 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 uh, a, a, a individualized decision for each patient. And 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 have them also take part in, in what their threshold of symptoms is. Uh, before they want to escalate therapy as well. So I think all of those things play into the individualization of care. And I also think that it's really important to understand what is it that the patient's primary concern is. Some patients come in and are terrified about being on a PPI long-term, and that's their major uh, reason why they're seeing us. Other patients want zero symptoms 100% of the time. Um, so knowing what a patient's goal is is very important. For uh, Dr. Kalmet's approach of swapping to a twice daily uh, dose of famotidine on the weaning process is also, uh, I would mirror that um, because you can have in those intervening weeks of weaning a PPI, um, rebound hypersecretion of acid over the, the week to two weeks following, which could potentially lead a patient that would have been able to wean off to jump right back on the PPI shortly afterwards. Great points. Um, kind of a slightly different question, uh, but again, related to PPIs. Um, one, uh, one attendee asks, how do you suggest we approach erosive esophagitis that is not healing after twice daily PPI for eight weeks? What do you guys think? Do you send them to Charu for a fundo? Do you do something else? What do you guys think about that? That's an excellent question. Uh, yeah. so uh, so I, I guess part of the, the question uh, also becomes, uh, it, it, when you repeat an endoscopy, uh, is there just no response or, or is there uh, some response but, uh, but not enough? Uh, so uh, some patients may go from LA grade D esophagitis to LA grade B esophagitis, and then, then I may just keep it on PPIs for a longer period of time. If there's absolutely no response, uh, you also have to look into if there are other factors involved. Do they have a large hiatal hernia, which may need to be addressed? In uh, these refractories of HIS patients, uh, scleroderma is, is something you need to think about as well. Do, you have, do they have a, 
uh, uh, scleroderma like esophagus uh, or some sort of this motility playing a role. And, and those are all things one can look into as well. Uh, resistance to PPIs is, uh, is rare, um, but, uh, but sometimes you'll have individuals where they don't notice an improvement with one PPI and you can swap it for a different one. And that's something you can use, although the, the, the yield of that is probably low, I would say. Yeah, and, and depending on the severity of the initial, uh, uh, the initial esophagitis, I, eight weeks um, may not be enough time. Uh, I, I'd likely give it more time before uh, abandoning that approach and moving to char. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I think these are, oh, go ahead. No, I think uh, I was saying that considering all this, I mean, though all those things are super important, diet, lifestyle, all those things. Uh, but at the same time, sometimes I think we underdiagnose mechanical problems. And if, if at the end of it, if there are mechanical problems, we have mechanical solutions as we've been talking about. And so I think uh, that is a viable option for the right patient and should be discussed at, at some point uh, when, while we're adjusting other things. Yeah, I mean, I think that um, we all have kind of seen these patients, bad, eso bad erosive esophagitis. For me, it's compliance? Are they actually taking it? A lot of times it's just poor compliance. And then you get into kind of the rare patients that the Dr. Kalmet mentioned. If I think that they're a hypermetabolizer, I'll switch them to rebeprazole uh, as, as an alternative, or I'll switch them to a different PPI. Your therapeutic gain is pretty low with that. Some patients, there's this idea that the acid pocket has to be addressed. So alginate uh, containing medications like Gaviscon. But the vast majority respond, and if I really am not sure, I may study them on P on PPIs. You know, are they really refractory? That's such an unusual patient population. And many of the earlier PPI versus surgery trials, one of the endpoints was healing of esophagitis. So I'm actually with you, Charu, that uh, in some of those patients who are not healing, um, and we've really given them a long time, tried all these other things, um, uh, th but those end up being rare patients. But I think that that's where a fundamentalization actually could really help. One, one actually uh, comment on that is, and of course, like you said, Kumar, we have to make sure that they get a thorough workup. But um, you know, one possibility in these patients who are quote unquote not responding to PPI is to make sure it's not the non-acidic reflux that's causing all these issues too. And, and typically for those with non-acidic reflux leading to esophagitis and with the mechanical problem, I think that those patients actually do very well with the mechanical solutions. Great, I think that was our questions for today and that sort of wraps up our uh, MINT 2021 day two. Um, we look forward to having everybody tomorrow where we're gonna switch gears and talk about practice building, innovation um, and have our second keynote uh, address. Thank you, everyone, and I thank all the faculty and all of you for being here. Thanks for all your questions. Uh, please keep them coming. Uh, we will see you tomorrow for an exciting uh, session for innovation, for multidisciplinary care, and also artificial intelligence. Have a great night. Thank you.